Welcome back to the Machine Learning at Microsoft YouTube channel. We've just had another really successful hack with Delta Tray, and Delta Tray are one of our top partners. Yeah. Um, they, they deal in the sports broadcasting industry and they have kind of quantitative events, uh, quantitative services which are built on um, events in sporting uh, matches. Right, and we went on to help them figure out when someone shoots on goal in soccer. Yeah, it, it, exactly. So this is kind of video action detection. Uh, now there was a whole team of us um, on this, so um, we have Tess here of course. Yeah, and Tim, and Carol, and then we also have... This Mitya, group. and Jana, and Klaus, and, and Vito. <laughs> So um, it, honestly, just speaking seriously for a minute, this was one of the most exciting machine learning projects that I've ever worked on. Wow. And for me, this is my vision of what machine learning could and should be. Um, I see it as a way for us to empower our customers to create new products and services which are built on data. So we're helping them unlock the power of their data using artificial right. intelligence. There are a couple of reasons why it was so good. First off, they had a good crew at Delta Tree that we worked with, yeah. very good crew. But we also had a lot of data which was crucial for this. Exactly, because you know, deep learning has this generalization problem. And in order for deep learning to work well, you need to have large amounts of annotated data. Yeah. So and large amounts of data allowed us to do an end-to-end -end solution actually, instead of doing more feature extraction. Exactly, because in deep learning, there's always a kind of continuum between domain-driven uh, versus data-driven. And of course, if you had an infinite amount of data, you can just be domain-driven. But um, we, we've already done a video on some of the approaches that we've done with Delta Tray. But what's really, really interesting is on this last hack, Carol has been looking at um, 3D convolutional neural networks. And we're incredibly excited about the results, and we wanted to do a supplementary video just kind of talking yeah. about that, really. So anyway, um, without any further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Carol. Well, I mean, I, I suppose this all started when we um, we had a meeting with our um, perception team over in Redmond, and we told them about the stuff that we've been doing with Delta Tray, and, and they kind of said to us straight away, well, it's a really interesting approach, because our, our main approach was using VGG embeddings for the individual frames in the video, um, and then we did a 2D CNN on top of that. Um, and they said that's a really interesting approach, but why not use a 3D CNN? So just 3D convolution just on the raw pixels? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. This is just 3D convolution on the pixel. And this is the example Amazing. that I said. The data that I get from this one, I, I just get it from myself. I ask 10 people to go in front of the camera and doing this action twice. That's it. No. That's, I've never seen such a, a recall. It's fine too, as I said. Yeah. Hello, this is Hamid. Uh, I joined Microsoft in early 2017, so it's less than three years in Microsoft. Before that, I was in Apple for about four years, and before that, I graduated my PhD in computer vision. And which team do you work in? So we are at Applied Science Group. So here, we don't do pure research. Whatever we do are related to the product that Microsoft is shipping right now, or we're gonna ship in future. So um, we got in touch with you a couple of months ago because we were working on this project with Delta Trade to predict when football players take a shot on the goal. And we had used the approach of, for every single frame, we take a VGG embedding on a pre-trained convolutional base. And then on the resulting matrix, we do a supervised classification. And we got reasonably good results. But when we when we showed that architecture to you, you, you immediately said, oh, you know, um, all of the state of the art approaches are using 3D convolutional neural yep. networks. Yep. Yep. That's actually uh, a common mistake from researchers. 
because we are very good on 2D. I mean, for the past five years, we are awesome on 2D. We do perfect segmentation, perfect detections. So, and we feel like because we are so good at something, we can solve all the problems with something. This, this is actually cool because you have a tool to solve all the problem. But starting from 2000s, let's, let's have a history of uh, 3D convolution. The first 3D convolution was proposed in 2015. It's called C3D. And it's very li- look like VGG and they try to make it 3D. Uh, it doesn't work well, so that's why many people that try 3D convolution, they have a bad feeling because of the first approach. But after 2015, few other people try to do 3D convolution, and a very successful one is in 2017, it's, it's inflated version of Inception, and they call it i3D. This is from DeepMind, and it's worked very well. I let's say why it works very well. The architecture is good, but the main reason that it works very well is data. Because at 2017, this is the first time that there is a data set of huge videos. So before that, when we're talking about video classification, action recognitions, we are talking about uh, 20,000 videos, 15,000 videos, and diversity is uh, not that much. And in 2017, in their paper, they propose a data set of about 400,000 videos. And they have 400 labels. I'm talking about 2017. Now, they extend their work with the 600 uh, class- classes and much more videos. And I would say this is the book for video classification right now. Just the way that ImageNet change uh, the, the image related stuff. I mean, this video also also changed the way that people try to solve the problem in 3D convolution. So let's say why I say data is important because I'm actually talking with the first author and say, how do you have this architecture? Because this architecture was state of the art for about one and a half years, which is impossible in our domain. So he told me that he tried different things, very normal, so every, whatever we, we are dealing, whatever we have a 2D convolution, he just changed it to 3D convolution. And the trick is he trained it on these big data sets. And when he trick, trained it on these big data sets, he leveraged all the data and the pre-trained data is public. Now, uh, whenever you want to do a very simple task, you can leverage those pre-trained data and then you can fine tune your network. So now you don't need 10,000 images, 10,000 videos to train a video classification. You probably need about, I don't know, 1,000 for each sample. It's, it's yeah. dependent on what's the quality you want. So, so that's really interesting because, you know, transfer learning is one of the things that makes deep learning kind of, it democratizes it for everyone because we can reuse these pre-trained models. And um, so after taking your advice uh, on the Delta Trade project, we use the um, uh, the C3D, so the standard 3D CNN. And that's really intuitive to understand how it works, isn't it? Because it's basically just using a, a 3D um, uh, kernel when it's kind of convolving over the volume and the, and the depth, of course, are the frames. So the, the depth is the time, if I've understood that correctly. And we downloaded a model that was um, pre-trained on the Sports 1 million data set. Yep. And um, so someone recently um, brought the inflated convolutional neural network to my attention. And I, I briefly read through the paper and it seems to say something like you take an inception network or a 2D CNN network and you, you kind of blow it up. So somehow you're using the depth dimension. But um, the key thing is, though, is, is that you, you can still reuse the parameters that were trained on ImageNet. So you get a kind yes, of exactly. double transfer. And my question to you is, is it the architecture or is it the double transfer that gives you the, the increase in performance? Uh, it's very difficult to answer your question. I would say both of them because the successful 3D convolution for the past few years, they all inflation of something. We have i3D, which is inflation of uh, inception net. We have ResNet, which w- ResNet 3D, which working very well recently, and it's the newest state of the art in new papers. And they are also exactly similar to ResNet. They change the blocks to 3D convolution. So I would say 
uh, the transfer learning is very important because whenever you want to have a 3D convolution, they inflate, they inflate the 2D convolution and they transfer the weights from uh, the 2D convolution, which work very well, and they feel all the depths. And now they start to train it from scratch. So uh, there is a good study to see which one is helping more. Uh, so what they do is that they try just ImageNet as a pre-train. They tried ImageNet plus Kinetics, which is a big video data set, and they try only Kinetics. Uh, obviously, RG, uh, R, obviously, ImageNet plus Kinetics is the best of all, but Kinetics itself is so huge. So Kinetics without ImageNet is also working better than ImageNet itself, but if you start from ImageNet, you're going to get much better result compared to not starting ImageNet. Okay, so this is a very interesting project that I did uh, more than a year ago. So what I did is I tried to do the 3D convolution, but um, the actions that I wanted was not in the data sets. So what I did is I asked few people standing in front of the video doing the actions that I want them to do. So it's about uh, 40 or 50 people and they do these 12 actions in front of me and they do twice. And then I train a network with i3D using these 12 actions and you can see the result. The result is very good. The result Amazing. is very good. Yes. And so, you, so you said about 50 people do 12 actions. So let's say it's 10. So 50 times 10 times 2 you know, recordings, and that was enough to get these results. Yes. And uh, because when I use the pre-trained data, I'm not training from scratch. I'm actually fine-tuning. So that's why you can solve the problem with this many data. And... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's not as difficult as... So the task is not that difficult because probably the clapping and waving hands are different from each other. But the fact that you can do it with so limited amount of the data is, 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 is a lot. Yeah, it absolutely blew my mind. It, it, it's amazing. You know, it's so exciting for, for practitioners because yeah. um, you don't need necessarily to be an, an expert. I mean, the, the thing is, some, sometimes I, I, we have to be careful saying this because, you know, you can say to people machine learning is really accessible and it's easy for you to put together the models that do this but sometimes machine learning models create a kind of technical debt because in production you need to have some rigor around you know are they robust are they performing as we ex uh, you know, as we expect are they um, are they biased and so on but in principle it is possible for people to achieve incredible functionality um, just using pre-trained models and, and adding yeah. a classifier on the end. yeah uh, yeah so Absolutely, and, and the, the meeting with Product Group was uh, very inspirational. Um, and that was actually when I first learned about the uh, 3D CNNs and um, 3D convolutionals. And, and uh, after that, when we had this hack with, um, with Delta Trade, I started investigating what's there, uh, what's available, and what we could potentially, potentially reuse. And um, I came across uh, this research paper. Let me share the screen. Oh yeah, this one. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Great. So I came across this paper, uh, learning spatial temporal features with 3D convolutional networks. It's back from 2015, which was kind of a surprise for me, but uh, still it, it, it talks through um, great new, uh, through a great new approach to 3D continents and uh, basically detecting actions in uh, videos. So that was pretty much what we were looking for. Um, of course, this is not the, um, the whole research. It's based on some different uh, research papers like uh, this one, 3D convolutional neural networks for human action recognition. And I think this paper is the very first talking about 3D uh, consonants. Um, although this one is, I think, from 2013, and back in there, uh, back in then, there was no uh, big enough data set available to make this 3D convnets really powerful because the big amount of data. Oh, 
Hello? Was there was this, and then was uh, something called layer scale uh, video classification with convolutional neural networks, uh, which came from Google research. And with this paper, they introduced a huge data set of um, of videos with um, with sport videos, and um, this data data set consists of over one million uh, video examples uh, with total of 487 classes. So that was this data set was actually big enough to uh, put the 3D convolutional networks into real use. And uh, that's basically what the people behind um, Con3D or C3D network from this paper did. They took the uh, Con3D net, built um, a very novel, uh, they came up with a very novel architecture of 3D continents. They used uh, the Google's, uh, Google's um, Sports 1 million data set, and they built this brilliant brilliant uh, model. So this is actually interesting because part of the reason why 3D CNNs were not sort of like at the forefront of our minds before was that we didn't really think that it would be possible to do transfer learning or that there was anything to transfer learn from, right? But um, the fact that you discovered... I'm not sure I understand. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand it either. <laughs> that was your um, iWatch. Yeah. The iWatch doesn't understand what we're talking about. Yes. But the fact that you discovered this and it was a sort of pre-trained um, on the Sports 1 million data set that's actually fairly similar and, and does have a lot of soccer mm. information in it, um. right? Yes, soccer was one of the games, one of the sports that was included in the data set, um, but there was like 486 more of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as you said, yes, we, we found the pre-trained um, pre free uh, C3D network uh, trained, on, um, trained on sports 1 million data set, and it turned out after couple of quick experiments, quick and simple experiments, it turned out that it's just brilliant. It, it, it works perfectly for our uh, needs. And in fact, I can um, I can show you some of the... Because one of the things the product team said to us is they're quite interested in human gesture recognition. And they said that when they took a pre-trained 3D convolution on your network, they could train it to recognize gestures with hardly any examples. Right. You had like two, three examples. Exactly. So it's, it's incredibly exciting because we, we always knew in our mind that transfer learning is, is a really, really good way of kind of reusing a model that's been trained on a much larger um, corpus of data uh -huh. somewhere else. So it's a way of kind of increasing your your um, data size mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and um, and I think the especially the temporal information that is uh, being uh, consisted by by, the, by these kind of models is very crucial for this uh, action recognition in videos. Well, I think that that's the key difference because before we were using transfer learning on VGG embeddings but now we're actually transfer learning on the temporal information as well yes correct and, and I think this is the, the biggest difference, and that gives us the, the, the this, uh, great results. So what is it you're um, showing here? This is um, the result of the model compared to the ground truth? Um, correct. I mean, it's even more than that. I mean, the graph is quite complicated, but it's uh, something that's actually the, the idea, the original idea behind this graph comes from Tim. And uh, when he first told me about it, uh, I thought this is a brilliant idea brilliant way of uh, kind of visualizing the results of inferencing or scoring the model against the full video footage, right? Uh, especially in our case, we have this long 45, 90 minutes videos. Uh, and we kind of had a good result when we compared our model, evaluated, evaluated our model against um, a fixed, uh, you know, test data set. But that's not really comparable to the, the, the whole video footage. And this really, this visual, visualization really gives us the opportunity to look closely into the details of, you know, when the model was activated, what did it uh, detect, and uh, how does that compare to the ground truth. Okay, so uh, in this first plot, we're basically using our simple VGG-based um, model or 2D model um, and um, this already gave us some really good results um, 
surprisingly good at this point. Uh, there was a, that was basically our baseline model. Um, as you can see here, we're plotting the full uh, full game here, so 45 uh, minutes. And um, on the left hand side, um, on this axis, we'll, we see the score value uh, retrieved from the model. Right. So the higher the um, the peak here. Uh, the higher the activation, and that basically means that the model detected um, action that we are looking for. Um, what else? Uh, right, we are doing some peaks clustering. So first off, we are plotting all the uh, results on this um, on this graph. Then we are um, clustering the the peaks, or extracting the peaks first, and then clustering them um, to kind of. Uh, like combine them into into segments. Right. So if you have Seg peaks right beside each other, they are not counted as one peak. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And, and just to set a bit of context here, so um, the timeline here, this is a football match and we're taking one half of the football match and all of the red crosses correspond to ground truth. So those are actual shots on the goal. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, the X the crosses are the peaks that we detected or the cluster peaks that we detected. Uh, the ground truth at this point is very, uh, barely visible, but it's, it's this uh, red line here. We should probably it. Uh, make it more visible, but it's here, here, uh, here, and here. I see. So there, there's a correspondence between the ground truth and, and the, the model peaks, but there's a lot of false positives. So the model is detecting a lot of things that are not marked as ground truth. Exactly, as you said, um, Jim. And um, I came up with a simple metric to kind of measure the performance of, of the model. Um, and first off, um, the actions recall. So basically, how many actions did we detect and were placed within the uh, segments or the clusters that we predicted, right? In this case, with this specific threshold that I'm using uh, for the score, we achieved 100% recall. But the um, uh, segment, segment's precision, so basically the correct or the um, segments that uh, include um, ground truth um, event, right, uh, divided by total number of detected segments. So in essence, segments. out of every 10 it, it picks, one of them is, is actually a ground truth. One of yeah, them just, is actually yeah. shot. Ten percent of the of predicted segments is uh, correct. Yeah, I think that's the true positive rate, isn't it? Um, the precision. Yeah. Yeah. The precision. Yeah. Correct. Cool. Okay, so it looked like we um, had a fairly decent model there with, with the VGG. And what's really interesting here as well is um, evaluating it in this helicopter view really allows you to draw intuitions on how the model is working. Because when we trained the model, we stratified it. So we um, we took uh, positive examples mm -hmm. and then we took negative um, samples, but they were just um, kind of randomly sampled from the negative space. And we had a negative sampling strategy. So half of them were just kind of uniformly randomly sampled and the other half were attacks which yeah. are things which are like a shot on the goal but not. But we should also say in this case that while it seems like it was it's only 10% precision like it turns out a lot of these peaks are not that different from shots on goal. Well, no, well no, that, that's very true. But the point I was making is that um, when we train this model, um, our accuracy would make would lead us to believe that the model was doing better than it was. Yes. And, and in, yeah. in this domain, we can see something's going wrong. But what we can do is when we go and look at the, um, uh, the underlying football match where these peaks are, we can see that the model is still doing something interesting. Mm -hmm. It's not just completely random. It's, it's detecting events which look like shots on the goal, yeah. but they're not quite what we expect. So to the untrained eye and to the VGG model, it looks like that's Exactly. We, we're not uh, domain experts <laughs> yeah. in football. Yeah. Um, yeah, as you said, Tim, um, I think the um, accuracy for, for the model when we were testing it or evaluating against our test data set, uh, stratified test data set, as you said, it was achieving, I mean, depends on the model, but something between 80 to 90% of accuracy, right? Which is nowhere near what we are seeing here right? but this this thing this graph gives us a great view on uh, what's really happening underneath and what are these uh, scores what, what what kind of um, results we are getting and that's not it that was the first one that was the base PGG model uh, we can even look at it 
um, on a more focused view to see what is really happening here. Um, so basically changing the, limiting the, um, uh, yeah, the X width here, um, we can see in detail what's happening, how the pixels look like uh, and, and all that. And one observation is there's a really good temporal correspondence. So when it does detect um, an event correctly, it's perfectly aligned over when the event actually happened. And given that we're using five second feature vectors and we're sliding over, um, that's actually pretty cool. Yeah, it is. It is very true. Um, yeah, so if we go down further here um, and plot the results for video inferencing using um, so yeah, so that was uh, the same VGG embeddings, but uh, with simple con 3D network uh, on top of it. Um, that was some media's idea to try it out. Um, oh, so, so just just to explain that, this is because the VGG embeddings they actually give you a spatial output, and most of the time people flatten it out of the spatial domain. But Meteor's observation was that there's actually still spatial information in there, and we can do a 3D CNN over time and space, and do kind of um, the same thing, but but, yeah. but you know, but over the um, over the end of the VGG encoder. Right. Correct. And um, that gave us pretty much similar results. If you look at the numbers, I mean, the probably the cluster peaks might be a bit lower. Yeah, here we had 38. So here we detected even more um, false positives, um, which kind of can be seen here with the segments precision. Um, yeah, so this gave us pretty much similar results. Um, if we look into details here, yeah, it looks more or less the same with just just with the difference that it detected more false positive. Um, I see. So the precision it. was slightly worse for for this football match. It seems like yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we have results from the C three D network. The C3D model uh, pre-trained on Sport 1 million data set and um, fine-tuned to, to our data set. And this one gave us the basically the best results um, for a single model um, here. And as you can see, um, I'm going to talk through it later on, but uh, we used for this model, we used a uh, lower threshold. Um, it just seems like it's it's giving us lower scholar range, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and, that, and that's interesting as well, because if we ever mix together these models, it kind of implies that we couldn't have one threshold, you know, over all of the models. The activation patterns of the different models um, change. So here, the activation pattern is lower, but there's a much better signal to noise ratio. And th th by the looks of it, our precision is more than double. Yeah, it's it's exactly. And actually, if you if you take a visual inspection of this, if you would just increase, sort of like the um, the threshold a little bit, like say point seven one, you might also lose some of the um, I mean, negative I, ones. Yeah. So there is an optimization that could be done, and that it would make it even more. Yeah, I mean, I, I assume Carol that you've already played with the threshold, and this is the best one. Uh, yeah, it's an optimal one, I would say, because as you can see, this ground to um, event is quite uh, right, um, quite near the, the threshold line. So um, they want to mess it up. <laughs> but yes, I was looking for some optimal threshold for each uh, each model. And again, if we look into uh, into the details here. It's, it's worth just mentioning as well, from an ML rigor point of view, if, if we were to set a threshold, it would be optimized on some held out matches. Because yes. here we're cheating a little bit by setting the optimal threshold on, on the same match we're evaluating against. But just, just, to, just to make that comment. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, and this is the more detailed view um, of our results. And um, what else? It's really, really uh, cool. Yeah, so the last thing I want to look into results or results for coming from combined uh, models. Um, so in this case, we're getting the um, scores for inferencing from all three models and um, combining them, combining the results, dividing them 
um, by by free in this case because we have free models. We didn't use any weighting um, for for each specific model. And this is the output oh wow and the precision is even higher so i suppose by combining them even though we're doing it in the most naive way possible we're just averaging them we're kind of taking advantage of the image net pre-training um on on you know the vgg and and indeed the sports one million pre-training right. on the 3d cnn right. absolutely and uh, this in fact gives us the, the best results i mean i haven't Check in so this cool. case mm -hmm. um, since VGG 3, 3D CNN gives us the most number of false positives, maybe uh, removing it would give us even better results. Yeah. But yeah, but it brings up a little and like an, an interesting point, which is we uh, we can't for sure say that 3D CNN is better than VGG or VGG with um, a 3D comnet because. They are trained on different things, and in fact, but the 3D CNN in this case are, is transfer learning from data that's very similar to the final test data. That, that that's true, and you know, there, there's no um, direct way to compare them. Because another thing as well, there there might be a difference if we were to do an ablation study. We have trained on about two thousand positive and negative um, examples of shots and no shots, and possibly the three D CNN model would require less training because it was pre trained on a domain which was more yes. relevant and which had temporal information. So uh, this kind of ablation study we we haven't uh, done yet. And uh, yeah, we can, of course, mm, do one more thing, but I am missing it here. It's worth just mentioning as well that I want to shout out to uh, Meteor um, did this incredible inferencing pipeline. So we've got this um, kind of video processing pipeline now, and we're, we're going to open source it at some point. Um, Delta Tray are going to release it on their GitHub. And um, the, Meteor does it in a really, really clever way because, of course, we can't load all of this data into memory at the same time. So using the MPyPal library, um, it can compose streams of lazily evaluated transformations. And the way that these models work is Meteor curses through the football match frame by frame, reusing the frames from the previous um, uh, sliding window step. And then, of course, he feeds the data you know, via NumPy arrays into these models. But it's, it's incredibly efficient the way that he's implemented this inferencing pipeline. Yeah, he did a great work, really. Um, I just want to see. Oh, yeah, there it is. OK. So I wanted to show you one more thing about this, because here we were plotting the combined results, as we discussed. Um, on this graph, on the other hand, I wanted to plot um, the results for each or the scores for each model separately. And on this helicopter view, it doesn't really give us good enough information. Um, but if we go into more detailed view, oh yeah, we can clearly see wow. how each of the models uh, behave and how they, um, and, and it seems like more or less they're detecting the same things or within the same um, time span. But uh, the activations, the activation strength is completely different for all of them. It, it is, and I suppose you can't read too much into the amplitude of the activation, although um, if there's a difference in signal-to-noise ratio, you can. But if there's a global difference in activation, that could just be a scaling thing. But what is really interesting is the 3D CNN seems to be slightly noisier. It seems to be picking up more... Maybe you can infer that it's picking up more precise information. Because, of course, having five-second feature vectors means we're kind of smoothing over um, quite a lot. But the 3D CNN is still picking up quite precise information almost um, second by second yeah 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 yeah. I, I I do believe so yeah um, and it's interesting, interesting because I, I still want to test another approach for this because as of right now we're basically taking a five second um, clip and extracting from that clip from that five second clip which is 25 uh, frames per second we're extracting extracting just 16 frames and passing that and these are not uh, consecutive uh, frames so and we're passing them uh, into the network the 3d cnn network i want to try out different approach uh, where we in fact use um, in a different sampling technique for, to to get out these uh 
these 16 frames. Yeah, because potentially that um, could improve the performance even more because at the moment yeah. the, um, the, the the time difference between the frames is, is different on training and, and, and inferencing. Um, why don't we, because um, we're 35 minutes in, why don't we have a look at the architecture? Ah, uh, sure. Um, so the, as for the architecture, it's not that sophisticated really. Um, that's basically it. This is the um, C3D model implemented in uh, in Keras. But one really interesting thing is you said that you use fine tuning. So um, you didn't just use the embeddings and then train a classifier independently. You you train through the the network. Oh yes, I did. So uh, I use uh, HGD as optimizer. I set the um, learning rate to really low value and just uh, trained it for around 10 to 15 epochs. Um, and yeah, and that gave us really, really good results. Um, yeah, so uh, all, all that we are doing is basically creating this, this architecture. This is the original architecture um, for uh, C3D. Um, that's why we are able to load the pre-trained weights coming from Sports 1 million. And um, and then we, we just basically pop this last layer here, um, the fully this dense layer, um, and we change it, it change it to binary classifier right. to look for, for shots, no shots. Cool. Got it. Yeah, I mean, this is so exciting for me because as, as I was saying at the beginning, you know, my vision of, of machine learning is that it, it allows us to do things that you can't write code to do. I mean, could you imagine 10 years ago, if, if you were a software engineer writing Java code and you were trying to detect when football players take a shot on the uh -huh. goal, could you even imagine? I mean, this is a whole new realm of potential functionality. And of course, we're, this is video action detection, but it's the same story, whether it's natural language processing or speech recognition. This is the power of deep learning. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Okay, well, um, any, anything else to cover? Uh, no, I don't think so. That, that would be it from my side. Uh, Brilliant. Unless you have any more questions. Well, I mean, from my side, kudos to you, Carol. I mean, because um, we, we had this conversation with the product team mm -hmm. and, they, and they said to us, use um, 3D convolution on your networks. And Carol jumped into gear. And I think almost the next day you had a working version. Yeah, and sure. to be honest, I was slightly skeptical about it because it seemed to be working. But I thought, no, it, it, couldn't, it couldn't possibly work. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it actually did. You yeah. know, and, and now we've, we've got this inferencing pipeline and we can kind of um, quantitatively um, compare and combine different models together. Mm -hmm. It's just worth putting a mention out there to some of the other models we've done. We, we did an audio model and it was a reasonably simple model. It was kind of looking at the MEL frequency spectrum coefficients and some, you know, uh, spectrum derived features. And we found that when we put that into the pipeline, it suddenly started behaving really badly. And we haven't as assessed yet whether or not we've just implemented it incorrectly or, right. or whether it was an example of we were optimizing for accuracy. And then when you look at it um, in context, it, it's actually behaving mm -hmm. really badly. Because the idea there is, of course, that the, the crowd is really loud when it, they shoot on goal. Exactly. So the, so the audio model seemed really noisy with mm. this helicopter view. And this is a real kind of warning to machine learning engineers because if you optimize naively on accuracy, um, especially if you're training on something contrived and stratified, when you actually put the model into production on, on real world data, the behavior is completely different. So we need to have ways of quantitatively assessing a model's behavior. Right. Um, and so anyway, the, the other the other models that we looked at um, on the second week um, were um, card detection. Yeah. Um, so um, Klaus was doing um, uh, image classification on frames pulled out of the video uh, detecting red cards. Yeah. And Part of the problem there, though, is the infrequency of cards in the videos. It, exactly. And it's kind of the same thing as, as well. When you're looking at events which are rare and then you stratify on your classification problem, it's actually a little bit contrived yeah. because when you when you um, uh, do inferencing in real world data, um, it, 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 it's... And obviously, uh, if you would discount accuracy on the whole video, it would be super easy to be like 99% accurate on it's exactly. not finding a card. Exactly. Um, and Jana was working on um, this heat map concept. And this is really, really interesting. She, mm -hmm. She's been um, developing this work. And that was um, looking at um, uh, object detection features, but stratifying them into So we have an image a of how that works here. So basically we have the, we look at taking out the, um, and doing object detection on people getting the squares and figuring out sort of where they are in the picture. Mm -hmm. So which square they fall into essentially yeah. to get 
um, more statistics around a are they huddled close together because that seemed to be something that was present when when people were doing shots on goal and also to avoid having sort of like close up shots yeah. and things like that or or at least marking for that because we could mark how wide the um, the object squares were exactly yeah so um, in every single cell there was a histogram of player numbers and widths I, mm-hmm. I think and that could be really interesting because when, when we run these models in practice there are scene changes there are close ups there are a whole bunch of kind of edge cases that make the model not perform as well and all of these models together could actually give us significantly more uh, robust performance so anyway um, I think that pretty much rounds up this video um, I think the next video we're going to do on this is a study on robustness and interpretation uh, in interpretability because these models are a little bit like black boxes and we're going to deep dive into how we can understand or at least try to understand a little bit more what the behavior of these models is. But anyway, um, it's been a fantastic episode. Um, Carol, say goodbye. Uh, Goodbye, thank you. So it's goodbye from him and it's goodbye from Tess. Yeah, goodbye. See you later. See you.